All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for taking time to join us. This is our, um, I think it's our fifth Century of Care speaker series. And my name is Daryl Mathers. I'm in the communications department. And we have three guests today. And before I introduce them, I just want to say how um, special it is to be here at this time in our history at Ontario Shores, um, actually celebrating a Century of Care. We've had a lot of things going on last year. And then the next uh, six weeks, it's really going to ramp up. So please, Watch our website and check uh, Shoreline for, uh, for details. So today we're going to have a discussion, all things Ontario Shores and, and mental health. And we have uh, three uh, special guests with us. We have Christy Jennings on the, uh, the far end. Christy is an ambassador of hope. She works for Shandex, which is a, a big partner of our Ontario Shores Foundation. And you'll see Christy at a, a lot of different events uh, involving Ontario Shores. And uh, she actually grew up in, in Whitby, so she kind of brings that perspective of, of having grown up in the community with a lot of the stigma and history attached to uh, the organization and then what she's come to uh, know about uh, our hospital a, as an adult. So thank you, Christy. Thank you for having me. We have Barb Murray. Barb's uh, also Ambassador of Hope, but a case manager in forensics, and she's been here for a number of years. She's actually close to retirement. How many weeks? 16. 16 weeks. <laughs> So before she uh, before she rides off in the sunset, we're putting her to work one last time, at least from communications perspective. So um, obviously, lots of experiences and stories that Barbara's going to share. And we have Leslie Stoben, and um, a nurse on complex psychiatry B, uh -huh. and uh, has pretty much worked in every aspect of the hospital, I believe. Right? Uh -huh. if we could, if you could probably spend the whole time just talking about all the units and different places <laughs> that you've worked in that probably don't exist anymore. There's nope. a few of them. So uh, welcome everybody, and uh, I'll start just by you know a, maybe a specific question to to Barb and Leslie about like how do you when you think about a hundred years or upcoming a hundred years what does that mean to you or does that what kind of feelings or experiences come to mind when you you think about the organization celebrating one hundred years? Well, it's just, it's just come so far, like from no patient advocacy to now a full patient advocacy with, you know, people working with the patients as caregivers, you know, so that's a good thing. We didn't have that back then. The patients, well, there was much more of them than there is now. Um, we had over a thousand at one time and probably like five nurses on a shift, if that. The nurses floated everywhere. They don't now. Like, every nurse floated everywhere part-time. So you went wherever you were called mm. at that time. Then they changed it over. Now they're changing it back. So it's, it's, it's really rewarding to see a hospital come from an old hospital to a brand new facility where the patients can prosper and grow. Mm. Barb? You know, I, I remember when I started working here and I, I talked to some of my colleagues who were at the end of their career and they told me about the, the years when it was a um, um, high number of patients, a lower number of staff, a lot of just diversional activities or just sedating patients to keep them calm. Um, we were very isolated and, and even when I started working here, um, we were in the cottages and the buildings, but we didn't have access to the community. There was nothing past um, Victoria Street. There was no metro, nothing here. So if the patients wanted to go in, uptown, we had to take them physically. So either drive them on outings, um, or there was a bus that came Monday to Friday, but not on weekends. So they were pretty much trapped down here. So we had to provide all of that activity and entertainment and diversion and now we have far more access to the community um, with the bus with actually patients uh, having their own vehicles and, and going mm -hmm. places more um, supports community supports and also more staff that we didn't have so the focus is, is quite a bit changed but I remember you know there was a lot of care given um, and the staff that uh, used to work here and have now long since retired talked about just trying to make it a, as much of a home and a, an enjoyable place to be. Um, but we've had so many other advancements that um, over the last hundred years, I think it's really changed uh, the dynamics of how we treat mental health and sort of try and get the, the community more involved and engaged in that process. Look, speaking of the community, uh, Christy, growing up in Whitby, what was your <laughs> understanding of what happened uh, on this property? 
Well, as being a whippy gal that played hockey at Iroquois all the time, I remember being scared to come down to Ontario Shores. It was always that street, you know, that was scary for us to come down to. Um, we didn't really know, I feel like, growing up about it. I remember my parents being like, if you go down there, you'll get arrested. It's scary down there. There's scary people. But I even know at, um, we recently did an open doors event down here and it brought a lot of the community down. And uh, it was interesting to hear their perspective when they came down and we're like, this is Ontario Shores. Like, it's, it's pretty amazing. And we're like, yeah, you need to come down here, bring your friends down here, go look at the history of it. It's unbelievable. If you get a chance to come down there and I, uh, down here, and I always tell people, um, you, need to, you need to experience it to know that it's not a scary place. It's welcoming, the people are friendly. Just say hi to everyone. Everyone here is some of the nicest people that I've ever met. So it's just coming down here and know that it's not a scary, a scary place to be, so. Well, I think that perception that you had growing up obviously common in our community but I think part of it was back then we didn't talk about ourselves as an organization right like not at all we did but not very much like we didn't get out there maybe on nurses week we got out there mm -hmm. to speak about it in the malls and stuff but not really that much no mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's, sorry go ahead Barb. well I was re remembering and I forgot <coughs> about it but uh, I used to work in a program called care or college 11 and we used to have on Friday afternoons during the school year, a group of uh, Henry Street High School students would come with their teacher once a week and they would just do activities with patients, whether it was board games or we'd have a dance or socialize. It was part of their community service, but it was also to try to engage them and, and understand a bit more about mental health. And I had forgotten we used to do that as a regular sort of connection, yeah. but it was only with Henry Street High. Other than that, we'd have some church groups that would come down and do coffee houses, or we'd go on a community meal where we'd take patients to a church dinner. But that was pretty much it for our community activity. Or at Christmas, if they came to buy the pillows and the Brock Street ceramics and Adirondack chairs. and I would like to know more about that. <laughs> the, the, patient, the patients that were um, less able to do things like lower functioning patients okay. would go to um, cottage 11 and there'd be three staff i still know the staff's names alice hayes worked over there she still works i don't know if she still works there anymore but we would make we they would make pillows so pilar furniture would send over the leftover uh, fabric that they had from their couches and stuff and the staff would have coffee on in the morning and the patients would have their breakfast on the ward and then they'd leave their breakfast to go over to Cottage 11 and they'd make, make pillows, stuff them and at Christmas and at Easter or whatever, we'd sell them. And for working over there, they got a stipend um, to buy their cigarettes or things that they wanted. But we also had an industrial therapy. If you were um, a little bit better on your scale of recovery, you'd go to industrial therapy for the day and with the break at lunch, you'd, they'd make, you know, put little packages of screws together or, or recycle things from GM. Yeah, they you, loved it. So, loved you mentioned, it. Barb mentioned the GM thing just before yeah, we uh, started. What, can you tell us a little bit about what that was all about? Um, so we used to get little um, uh, projects. So for example, General Motors, used to send us over these big boxes of uh, plastic nozzles that they used to inject foam in their seats. And after a couple of uses, uh, the foam would clog up, so they would send us all these plastic nozzles, the patients would clean them out, uh, pick out all the foam, then clean them, and then send them back to GM, they'd recycle them and use them over and over again. So it was saving the environment, it was giving them a little bit of money. Uh, that they could, uh, the program would get the money and then would put back into, um, you know, activities for the patients and they would get a little stipend at the end of the week. And then also some of that money went towards a Christmas party or Christmas gifts. So it gave them um, an activity to do during the day because often they were in group homes because a lot of the ones that went there were um, outpatients. Mm -hmm. So they were expected to be out of the house for a period of time during the day. They would come here. We'd actually have a bus that would drive along Highway 2, picking them up at different locations and then bringing them into the hospital. Then that program moved to Brockstop uptown and then eventually over to Hopkins Street where they rented out um, a complex and they also did woodworking, uh, garden care. So if you had uh, lawn maintenance you wanted done at your house, they would go and cut your grass in the summertime. They would plow your uh, driveway or 
or shovel your driveway in the winter. And they were also learning the skill. Some of them went on to doing that full time. Doug Greenfield planted a lot of gardens. <laughs> a lot. He was so good with that. He'd get those patients out, plant mm. those gardens. They look beautiful by the end of the year. You were, you, sorry, go ahead. We also had um, a volunteered up at Winreach Farm, which is up in um, yeah. Brooklyn, uh, just north of Brooklyn. Uh, so there was, um, I used to take patients every Thursday morning and they would walk around the property uh, filling up bird feeders and caring for some of the small animals. In the summertime, a couple of the nurses would come up with another group and they would maintain the gardens there. And we even had a little plaque put on that these gardens were maintained by Whitby Mental Health Center uh, residents. Um, so we did started developing more community connections for um, those type of programming. Before we move forward, we'll go back a little bit, because you mentioned the farm and that a lot of people didn't even know. I that. wasn't here for the farm. I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. but, but you grew up in the area and you remember. I, the yep. The farm at one point, it burnt down in 1976, but um, the initial um, thing that they were going to do with the farm, and it was, it was self-sustaining. So the patients would go out and help with planting, help with, you know, getting the meat, help with doing anything, and that would be that would be their dinners, and then they go through the tunnels, which you've all probably heard about the tunnels that were underneath. Tell Christy, us more. Yeah, yeah tell us more about the tunnels. As someone that I never work went here. in the tunnels. But <laughs> they were boarded up like when we started new construction, but there were tunnels that in the winter, if the patients didn't walk out in the cold, the staff who would eat with the patients at that time would go through tunnels that were throughout the hospital right. and go in the main dining room and eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All the patients from the whole, every ward. So that gave them a little bit more camaraderie too. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. It's interesting that, um, you know, being in a hospital, there's codes often and some certain codes you'll see people being uh, or in the hallways, walking very fast or running. We didn't walk. Yes, you were saying, how did you respond to codes in the cottages days? In our own car. <laughs> so you would actually get in your car? Oh, we'd pile in the car because you never <laughs> knew. You never knew you'd get the overhead, but you never knew mm -hmm. who was going to be mm -hmm. hurt. Like the mm -hmm. medications were good back then. They were more sedating, but you never knew. No, 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 no. <laughs> they were good as far as... We had less staff, you know, but no, you got your car because you never knew who was going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. So that way, the hospital was much closer. Mm -hmm. Like you knew everybody, mm -hmm. like because you relied on those people. And lots of times you didn't even have to say anything. It just be because we didn't mm -hmm. have we tied we restrained them. Tied them up. <laughs> we restrained them with sheets back then. Mm -hmm. We didn't have. Yeah. Um, security, yeah. like all the nurses did it. So if you were lucky enough to have men, mm. you're not supposed to say that now, but we mm. did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so when you're just getting back to the tunnels piece, because we were talking about, you guys have, um, you remember haunted horror stories about the this place, right, Christy? Yes, that, I've remember? heard all the horror, yeah, the haunted horror stories all the time. And Barb and Leslie have different views on whether this place was actually haunted. They say that they say the admitting one was really haunted, that you only <laughs> see half her up because the floor was, um, they put a new subfloor in. So apparently she was from the military and she would walk the halls with her full cap and gown on. And, yeah. and what about the elevators? <gasps> the elevators, we don't <laughs> like them. They used to go up and down. And we'd say, um, did you go to the elevator and put the laundry bags down? No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> okay, the elevator just went up and down again. <laughs> so, yeah, we feel they were haunted. And there was a cell down <laughs> in the basement, which made it even scarier. So. And Barb's view on that? Uh, I never worked in any of the buildings that have elevators. Um, <laughs> never saw anything that I couldn't explain logically. I mean, there were certain, certainly, you know, unusual things that happened, but they were usually a result of somebody's psychotic illness or just behaviors and no, I never saw anything. I do think that I heard a lot of the stories and there were a lot of misconceptions once we moved to this hospital and the buildings across this, the 
the cottages when they were still there uh, started getting visited by urban explorers and windows would get broken and I'd see things post a picture on the internet saying oh this was uh, you know the electric th shock room and I'm going that was an electrical panel <laughs> and, you know, that, that can really be explained but there was a lot of those uh, stories and rumors that went around and they were just perpetuated and really just not valid at all just old buildings that were falling falling down unkept and and become destroyed by these urban explorers so you mentioned movies that there were a few movies shot here they, well when it was closing when they were thinking of starting building a new facility they um bambi ben Bunny, woman on the run was here <laughs> and there's been a couple um people do videos here before and the, the the producers and stuff were really good. They let the staff walk all around, see the sets. Some mm -hmm. of you got to eat the, some of the stuff. It was pretty good. One of the Iron Eagles movies was filmed partially yeah. here, and, and also they used the uh, well the the old house about the street as a backdrop for yeah. the military headquarters. They never used filmed inside, but they just closed off the road for some filming for. A few things. The architecture was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like the doors were, you know, solid, solid wood. Like they never, the doors never fell apart. And I swear, if they were here today, they'd still be good. When they were in the process of building this building and, and <coughs> removing the cottages, uh, I know on the timeline, I think it was the rec hall, they were giving away bricks to staff. Um, you mentioned a bar, you wanted a barber's chair. I wanted the barber's chair. <laughs> I want it too now I, that I heard about it. <laughs> I don't know? know who got it, but I hope somebody got it. <laughs> Me too. Because it was a beautiful chair, it was original, had all the original leather on it, all the original steel. It was absolutely gorgeous. So I phoned Bill Bergstrom, who's no longer with us, but was really instrumental in bringing this facility to what it is now. Mm. And said, can I have the chair? No. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I almost snuck in yeah. to get it, but I didn't. So how did that, was that stuff like by request or how did some of the, uh, those artifacts end up uh, in employees' possessions? I think they just ended They're up just in employees' possessions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that when I we were moving over here that was done in stages and we were told not to bring anything. So like not to bring a kettle or microwave, all of that would be provided over here. But then staff got over here and in their staff rooms, they found that they weren't, they didn't have a kettle or they didn't have a coffee maker. So people slipped back and got the ones that they had and in those days, staff had to purchase them themselves. They weren't provided. So if you wanted a, a kettle or a coffee maker for your break room, you had to chip in and buy it. So they snuck back and got the ones they already had. The, the issue with that is they had to still go through uh, trades to make sure that they were still mm. electrically sound. Like now. Yeah. Yeah. But what's most interesting, the beds that we have now, when we came over, we were shocked that there was going to be individual rooms and double rooms because the beds were a big long room. Mm. And that was from 1919 when they built mm. the facility to mm. basically when it closed. Mm. So all the patients would be in, like all the females would be in one room, all the males would be in the other room, and then there'd be Just curtains. seclusions <laughs> down the halls. Well, how big of an of an adjustment was was that, and just moving over? Oh, to that the was new a nice one. Yeah. That so, was what about a nice the? One. What do you remember about the transition from the from the cottages to the new facility? I didn't work in the cottage, mm. so I worked in Stat A and B mm. um, near before we moved, and they were big, long mm. buildings, mm. and two stories. So mm. there'd be a build um, a ward on top and a ward on bottom. Mm. So, but just going from that model to the, the new building was. Um, I think the patients had a hard time adjusting because, like, everything was changing for them. They went to single rooms, you know, from a, one big ward. They went to a new name. They went to, you know, having a facility that had a pool, that, you know, mm. more accessible things to them, which they didn't have before. Yeah. I think too, with especially the patients in the cottages, they had to go outside to go anywhere. So if they wanted to go to the canteen, they had to go outside and physically walk. Where now everything's under one roof, they didn't even have to go outside. Some of those courtyards weren't accessible unless the staff opened them up. Um, so I think we lost some of that kind of accessibility to the outdoors because we used to in the summer have uh, barbecues. Um, patients would sit outside on the front porch, staff would put on a hot dogs or hamburgers as a snack. 
um, not their main meal, but we would do that. Yeah, and, do that like that. and so we spent a bit more time outdoors. Uh, in, but then in the winter, you were pretty much trapped. So now we had this, you know, everything under one roof. And, and so there was a lot more opportunities to get off your unit and, and uh, just wander around without having to go outside in the elements. When, when it was announced that they were going to build the new building and, and, and it was actually going to happen, I think it was a, there was a funding announcement years before that, I think yeah. that didn't happen. Um, what was a, what was a, do you remember what it was like among staff or what it was going to mean or like was there a lot of excitement like was it time? I think it was really anticipation because we just didn't know what it was like some of the plans were shared with us but uh, most of them weren't so when we came over staff came over and was given the opportunity to come over you know like weeks ahead to see the tour it was pretty exciting yeah. like wow, we have bigger offices, you know, we didn't have that. We at the celebration? When that yeah. Hit, yeah. You, yeah. What was, uh, what happened there? Um, I can't remember your cost food. There was a know, lot of people there, was there not? Oh yeah. yeah, well, and while they were building this facility, we also had the 75th anniversary. Mm. So there were a lot of activities around that for a whole year. Um, we had a Heritage Days where we invited the, the community to come down. They set up booths and uh, farmers market outside, similar to what sort of we had this year. Um, they had um, murals painted on the construction boards that were sort of blocking part of the construction site, so that the some of the patients in the geriatric unit, their their windows used to look out on the construction site. So they put these uh, boards up, and different departments went and painted a section of board. Uh, as a mural, so that gave it um, some activities. There was also one of the uh, cottages, they basically made up mock-ups of what the nursing station would look mm -hmm. like, what the bedroom areas would look like, so you could go over and look at the mock-ups. And also they tested out some of the materials just to see what were the best yeah. materials to use. So there was a lot of consultation from uh, frontline staff uh, and even staff that worked here were part of that building process that were seconded to the construction. So a lot of staff input went into building this building. They looked at the little things you might notice in the um, in the bathrooms, the little hooks that kind of, they're not permanent hooks, so they'll, they'll fold under weight. So that was to consider to make sure somebody didn't try and hang themselves uh -huh. or choke. Same with the, uh, the bedroom in the bedrooms to make it as safe as possible. So a lot of consultation over that period of time prior to the construction and then through the construction. So we kind of covered a lot of like the physical mm -hmm. kind of changes that you've seen over the years. What about in how you've um, done your job? Uh, like what has technology, how has that influenced or, uh, or changed the way that you and your colleagues uh, provide care? Well, we used to write all the notes, right? Like, didn't they have carts or something? Wasn't there a patient record? You know what? Cards? We just got rid of our cart the other day. <laughs> it was like, let's get rid of this cart finally. Yes, we had carts. Mm -hmm. And every, every chart was put on it and every discipline wrote on it. And the medication sheets, um, the doctors would have to write once a month. Mm -hmm. So they'd look at the old sheets to see if they wanted to make any changes. And they'd have to write every single patient out um, per month. And the nurses would check them and sign them. And yeah, it, it was very, very different. And then any changes that were made, had to be made on the sheets and, and put a new sheet and rip it and send it to pharmacy. So it was really different then. Yeah. Seclusion rooms were different. Yeah. Like when I first started, seclusion rooms were all the way down the hall. You didn't have an IOTU. Yeah. You didn't have a PICA. You had like, and we were schedule one then. Mm -hmm. So if somebody acted out then, well, let's just say I've emptied a social worker's office to yeah. Um, allow for seclusion at night sometimes. Mm -hmm. And restraints, like I said, the nursing staff did it. Mm -hmm. No help from it. Like, we did it. And we did fine. <laughs> <laughs> Barb, anything? Um, <clears throat> we didn't really have computers, and computers were just starting to come in when we transitioned to this facility. So just prior to the move, I think each unit had been given one computer, and it was more to get staff familiar with using computers because people didn't even have personal computers at home. So when we came here, we now had 
three or four computers in every uh, unit plus offices. Um, prior to that, I remember dictating my notes over the phone, and, and that's how most of the doctors Nurses did didn't do that. As well. Nurses charted. We would have daily notes we'd write, but uh, monthly assessments I used to dictate uh, so that they would come out nice and typewritten, and that's the only way some most of us could read them because a lot of handwritten notes were you just couldn't read half the time. So and reports all had to be dictated. Um, so yeah, so having come in here and the, just a change in the technology, and then huge advancements in in medicine too, uh, medications. I remember when clozapine first came out and we had education on it. It was a new drug, and the changes it made in in some of our patients taking away their psychotic symptoms overnight was just like a miracle. Um, and other, you know, medications that there were some advancements and we're getting new staff. Uh, we had a lot of doctors that would be here and, and spend their entire careers here. Then we started getting more and more doctors coming um, for short periods of time as part of their education and bringing in new ideas. So, Christy, I wonder, like your role in the 100th anniversary has been to kind of promote Ontario Shores and mental health, and you know, you have attended some events uh, and uh, luncheons and different things like that. You know, listening to Leslie and and Barb talk about you know the history and like, do you feel like the community has a sense of what we do here? Or we still have a long way to go. I think we have a little bit to go. I know I've been I attended with Chris. We've done some events together and going out to some of the luncheons. And some people still ask um, what Ontario Shores is, which is interesting. But um, I think we're getting there. We're getting the word out, um, even with social media and things along those lines. Um, I think with sharing and people understanding exactly what Ontario Shores is and what it does, um, I think we're, we're getting there for sure. Um, we have a, a little bit to go, but um, with getting the word out for 100 years, I think um, you guys have done a great job, especially with social media and things along those lines. So, yeah. As we, we were about six weeks away from officially turning 100 and uh, you know I, Barb counting down days till she retires I'm sure <laughs> but what has uh, you know you can you can do your you can work anywhere what has kept kept you here these people mm -hmm. it's the staff because you can go and I have been to a general you can go to a general hospital and you will never get the camaraderie that you have here you will never get people caring about each other, you, you just don't get it. In the general hospital, I just feel they're too busy. And here, you know, if a staff is sick, if a client's sick, somebody's always there to help. Like, if you need help with a client, somebody's there to help. It's just that basis, like your second home, the warmth that you need from your second home. And I was, if I can kind of go off that, I was going to say, even for me, I'm not here every day. Obviously, I'm just a volunteer, so I'm in and out a couple times a month. Um, it feels like a second home to me. I know even right when you walk in, the foundation's right there. They're literally the nicest people I've ever met. Um, saying hi to every single one of you. You guys are always so welcoming and so kind. So um, as a volunteer, I'll keep coming back because of you guys. So. Again, I'd have to say the staff, I've been blessed with working with some great colleagues over the years, had some good managers, um, but also the patients I've worked with. And I still, I, I, luckily I get to go into the community uh, and visit some group homes where I have a, a few clients and one in particular up in uh, Newmarket I go into and it's like everybody at one time has come through the doors of Whitby and they'll say, oh, can you say hi to so-and-so for me? Can you say hi to, <laughs> is this person still there? And they still have fond memories of being here and to see them, have, they've moved on and are living successfully in the community. Um, I've had, actually one of my former uh, clients has said to me, he wants to be in the 11 no one I'm retiring, he wants to be here. Mm -hmm. that, that role I played in, in helping him was important. So I get a lot of you know, satisfaction from hearing that. And just, I've, I've really enjoyed 33 years working here. Yeah. There have been some, you know, ups and downs and some days where I could forget, but I have because yeah. the, the memories I think back on have all been very positive. And I know I was lucky to be in recreation therapy for almost 20 years and 
was able to do a lot of activities, fun activities. We went camping, we went boating. We used to have an annual boat trip that the Kiwanis used to host in Toronto uh, in August, and we would take three or four busloads of patients here for an evening cruise around Toronto Harbor with patients from CAMH and some of the other yeah. community supports. So you've got 300 patients on this boat and all these buses, and it was always a fun night. Uh, it's, it's funny because you like there's a saying that if you don't you know those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it but there's so many things as we're talking here that have kind of come like full circle right like maybe um, even the social enterprise aspect right that we had the hugest or the biggest social enterprise going we had a farm a self-sustaining yep. farm we yep. had the Brock stop and, and then that, that there's an area that we're trying to explore now and well find. we had the step program it mm. started that was new to you know, new to Ontario, I think, if not new to Canada. We had the PTU program, it started here. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Taylor did that um, back in the old hospital. And there was programs that were instrumental in changing what's now, mm -hmm. as far as treatment to patients, so. It, it's great. really, I, well, Christy, what do you think of, you know, this, to me, like list, listening to Barb and Leslie talk about their experiences, it's, I've already learned a lot just in the time we've been talking, but is this um, beyond what you thought the hospital was all about? Definitely. <laughs> even talking to them beforehand, before we even came up here, I lit literally could listen to them all day, and I'm pretty sure I told you guys that. Um, so much knowledge, there's so much history, there's so much to learn. Um, even with the artifacts, I know we were talking about that, like even going a second to read everything when you go over there and the pieces that they that they keep going and alive um, is, is really interesting. And I could, like I said, listen to you guys all day. So I appreciate all the time that you've, you've given here, to be honest, it's pretty amazing. Thanks. You're welcome. So thank you to all three of you. And thank you to everybody who joined us and watching mm -hmm. online. Um, we are celebrating 100 years on October 23rd. And until then, our art gallery currently has our Century of Care juried art show. So hopefully everybody checks uh, that out. That's artwork inspired by mental health and uh, kind of our history in the community. So hopefully everybody uh, watching this and here today gets to check that out. So thank you very much for, no thank for you your for time having today. Me. Thank you.